throughout the last couple of weeks, we talked about all the issues that the Bears have, and we've gone back and forth on where to place the blame, who to point the finger at. And I think this time around, with this game against the Broncos, it's obvious. Is this coaching staff really capable of even winning a game this year? Um, can, can they make any adjustments throughout a game? It was clearly their fault why we lost this game. I mean, being up 21 points on a team, there's very few scenarios where you should wind up losing that game. If you just, you know, do your job as a coach. I mean, they had a chance to go up by three points late in the fourth quarter and take a lead against the team. And they wound up losing by those three points that they didn't take. And that that's purely a coaching decision to go on and on fourth down. And they should be completely held accountable for their choices. I blamed the players a lot. I blamed execution a lot. This time, I, I can't. Fields went, you know, at one point, Richie mentioned he was 26 for 28. At that point, I can no longer blame Justin Fields if he's doing his job. And like I said, if he's making his layups, if he's doing his jobs, then I could sit here and shift my blame over to something else. And it, it, they made it clear as day that, they are not a competent NFL coaching staff. That was like an instant firing when it happened in the moment when they went for a run up the gut on fourth and one when they were right there in field goal range. It's not like Cairo Santos is a bad kicker. He's been a good kicker for us, you know? I couldn't believe it. That made Eberflus look freaking terrible. If all of a sudden they look really good, the the coaching staff and the, the team, good for them, you know? And I guess it's a young team. Everyone can screw up. They could, you know, win more games or whatever. But he looked dumb as hell doing that that is a pretty huge black eye on him and he's probably gonna get fired at the end of the season i would say it's like a 70 percent chance he gets fired at this point you're getting out coached by basic level coaching in the nfl the broncos are one of the worst second half teams in all of football this year and they got absolutely dominated by coaching in the second half of the game the bears did so the bears getting completely out coached by sean payton single-handedly in the second half tells you pretty much everything you need to know. Additionally, your game plan completely changed what you did. And this was one of those uh, those cowardly coaching moves that you see in the fourth quarter where they just completely take their foot off the pedal instead of playing whatever made them successful all the way up until then, where they're just running the ball up, you know, first and second downs, trying to kill as much clock because you're just scared you're going to give up this lead. And it's just, it looked a little pathetic towards the end. Um, another issue is also... You have you can't gauge anything off of this game. This is the Broncos. For a second, we looked so much better than the Broncos, and for three quarters, you're saying, "Oh my God, maybe we're not the worst team in the league." At least the Broncos are so much worse than us. And then you lose to the Broncos. I want to overreact to this game, and I want to say that Eberflus is the worst, and he's lost the locker room, and this and that and the other. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's as bad as we see it to be. And I also think that a four-day work week for professionals is always a good way to just not overthink about a loss like this. So I think if Eberflus loses Thursday night, you might see an overreaction from the McCaskies or from uh, Kevin Warren or something. Luke Getzey had a press conference today. He was asked, how much of the success you had on offense do you attribute to actual – offensive production coming together and how much do you attribute it to facing the worst defense in the league? And he immediately brushed off the worst defense in the league comment. He said, listen, this is the NFL. Everybody's good in the NFL. Um, and that's that any given Sunday argument, which is, yeah, there's always a chance you can win any game any any week in this league. Right. And, but the fact is that there is, definite talent gaps between teams in the NFL. Now, yes, it's the NFL. These guys are great. They're great compared to me and you. Like, they are professional athletes. They're out there. They would whoop our ass every week. But when you face a team like the Chiefs, who are a playoff-ready team, uh, just came off winning a, a Super Bowl, they wipe the floor with you. Then you face a team that just let up 70 points the week before. And you have to take that into accountability that they're a bad defense, that there are spots you could take advantage of and this and that. And I just felt like him brushing that, like, no, it was all 
due to our offensive scheme actually coming together and actually working this and that. No, if you face better competition, it's proven that you failed. I just want to play this little clip for you guys. When it comes to the fumble that Fields had, listen to what Luke Gessie had to say. And said the rule there is just don't take a sack on Nick's bootlegs. What, what can, what's the coaching point there if he has his back turned? in those situations so that doesn't happen again. Yeah, I mean, he, we just talked about the goal line play was exactly the same thing. And so whenever you whenever you know you have what we refer to as a dirty edge, which every pretty much every uh, bootleg keeper that we have is a dirty edge, you got to come out high. And when you recognize it's got the rusher is high, you got to pull up. And so uh, he didn't do that on that particular one. He did it on the other one and created a touchdown for us. And so uh, it's part of that learning experience that you get in games and seeing the way everybody's game planning you specifically. So he specifically refers to Fields not adjusting to that blindside rusher. Not not taking any accountability that he's going to sit here and game plan a little bit differently and try and put you know somebody in there to chip block or do anything. No, we're going to put you in this position, and you got to handle it better. Nagy 2.0, folks. That's what we got. Yeah, his, even his explanation doesn't really line up to what he's explaining as if that first broken uh, dirty edge that he explained was some sort of, you know, hey, Fields made the proper adjustment and played it. No, he made a miracle play. He juked out the defender. He juked out the defensive end two, three times and then made a, you know, a six-yard rocket shot right to Khalil Herbert. So that it's not accurate. You don't make any adjustments. You don't take any accountability. And you're a team and coaching staff that preaches accountability. And then when you clearly make a mistake, you absolutely don't own any of it. The way he explained it there, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding or he didn't explain it very well, but he explained it like a dirty edge is just something that happens regularly. Like a free rusher is just going to happen regularly all the time on his play designs. And it's like, what the hell are you talking about? No, <laughs> that's not how it's supposed to go down. They're not supposed to have free rusher every play. Me and Polly were waiting for the like, see, I told you so. See, I told you so. You guys were overreacting. And it's like, your overreaction to us reacting to three games is not us overreacting to three games. It's you overreacting to a blip against the worst defense in the league. They preach accountability. They definitely don't practice it, though. And we, you know, um, we saw that with this whole Chase Claypool situation. You know, we as fans have sat here. And I, I've had some debates on people on the YouTube channel and comments and stuff like that. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was saying, hey, the Chase Claypool mobs after me because I would not put him in some of the wide receiver highlight videos I made. And, you know, my response was, well, what highlights has, like, I, I can't just make it up. I only pulled a video from what's existing out there. And Chase Claypool himself has not done anything. 14 targets and four receptions from Chase Claypool. And, you know, they decided to sit him. Fine, which is the right move. We've been saying, hey, you need to hold this guy accountable for his production on the field. And, you you know, a guy like Equinemius St. Brown being healthy on the sideline, that's so – it's got to feel so shitty knowing that you can go in there and just even put more effort in I'm not even saying production, at least just plain effort in and earn the respect of the teammates around you. If you listen to Matt Eberflus and what he had to say about this, I'm just going to play this clip for you guys real quick. You could kind of put two and two together that it was Chase Claypool's attitude and not necessarily his production on the field that got him benched. His reaction was, you know, we'll keep it there. I don't, it's between me and him. To explain why there's the sudden divorce and separation. Because it's a, it's a conversation between uh, us, me, him, and Ryan. What we think is best for the team and how we operate here as a football team, you know, right? I talked about, you know, being on time, you know, being respectful and working hard. We have a standard for that. We have standards for that. And if those standards are met, then everything's good. If it's not, then, then it's not. Being respectful, being on time, and working hard. That's the standard. It's not production on the field. You know, it's, you know, when you lose, right, we, we, we've lost a couple games here this year. And, uh, you know, for me, it's like uh, everybody has frustrations, you know, but you got to be able to control your emotions. So that tells me Claypool did not control his emotions. But the glaring statement out of all that, in my opinion, is we've lost a couple games this year. You've lost every single game this year. I, I think you might be reading into it a little... Uh, bit specifically there because 
if Claypool was having an issue being on time and working hard, you know, then those are bare minimum things that he's not even doing, that he's not even doing correctly. And they were just tired of him, you know, but obviously this happened after he spoke up about uh, coaching or them not using him correctly or whatever. And I mean, that still makes the staff look bad, but no one looks good here. Absolutely. No one looks good here on this chase Claypool experiment that we spent basically a first round pick on. Um, he, like you said, didn't produce even when he was in, he was falling over on routes when the ball was being thrown at him. He was dropping balls. He wasn't blocking. He did look terrible. He's looked terrible this whole time. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, with chase Claypool, there's a lot of issues with accountability just overall in this team. And I don't know if Chase Claypool felt some sort of bravery to speak up, but it's very interesting to me to see somebody who's obviously the least accountable player on the field, probably feeling like he's the hero in the locker room, speaking up on behalf of his teammates that all feel the same. And based on how you saw this team perform after knowing that Chase Claypool got benched, I don't necessarily know if that's the case. We're reading into a lot of things that we don't know. Um, But there was no mutiny in the locker room. No other player talked about Chase Claypool or, you know, hinted or read read between the lines here. So nobody really had Chase Claypool's back. And then on his comments, like, is the coaching staff using you correctly? I challenge anybody to tell me what is the correct way to use Chase Claypool because I can't tell you one specific thing that he's good at or better than anyone else at. There was an audio clip that came out of DJ Moore talking with another player. And, and the other player on Tampa said, man, they're, they're not using me right. And he goes, tell me about it. The same thing was said by DJ Moore that was said by Chase Claypool. They're not using me correctly. But they're going to sit here and finally use that as a, a reason to bench Claypool. The reason to bench Claypool is the production. It's the four receptions on 14 targets. We, we said that probably, I mean, I think in the first half of football, we were like, if this – the most insulted player that should be uh, on the Bears by halftime of the Packers game was Equinemius St. Brown. Like, I have to be benched for this? Is It's insulting to the other players. So maybe seeing Equinemius St. Brown and the team taking some accountability is what actually gave him a wake-up call. And we hinted at the fact that this regime is just not straightforward with information, and it frustrates us. And you, you have to earn that. You're not Bill Belichick. You're not being candid because you're savvy. You just won't say the, the honest truth. Mike Tomlin gets asked, hey, when you get blown out by Houston by 23 points, are there going to be some changes? And his response exactly was, hell yeah, there's going to be some damn changes. I was like, it's very hard to do your job when there's all these murmurs and whispers everywhere I walk and turn and go. So that's my bigger problem than the accountability issue is just, just be straightforward. It's the, the lying and the sweating and watching Iberflus just sweat it out at the podium is just uncomfortable at this point. Listen, maybe in college or maybe if you're um, a position coach and you're just in a room with five linebackers, maybe you could sit there and preach this bullshit and have it be eaten up and actually get away with it. But you are a leader of a football team of grown ass men who are making a paycheck week to week doing this. I mean, you're literally ruining all these guys opportunities moving forward in the future to make more money because well the statistics show that they all suck and they all suck because of you like it's this has unfortunately become like an evaluation season we came in with high hopes and everything i i thought it was funny that david mentioned every is looking like he's sweating it out every press conference it looks like he just got punched in the nuts two minutes before every press conference it was gradual he looks extremely uncomfortable up there this is a guy who might be a good, like, college coach or, like you said, Polly, positional coach. This is where, you know, like, my school has, like, an anagram, and this works on, like, five-year-olds. You know, like, P-R-I-D, you got to be prideful, and each letter stands for something. Like, hits principle? You're telling me, like, the Eagles are walking out of there and go, like, T, try hard. R, run the ball. <laughs> Why you matter? Like <laughs> what the, f- the right. fuck are we doing here? What is this nonsensical bullshit? Yeah, they drop the hits and they turn it into shit. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, you have not won a game in almost a year. You had an opportunity with, I believe it was 
under four minutes in the fourth quarter to take a lead and you passed it up. It's a desperate move from a desperate man to go for it on fourth down and lock in and solidify the win. He's just like, well, if I kick this field goal, there's still a chance I might lose this game. I got a general question for the both of you. So, and this confuses me all the time. When it comes to these analytics and statistics that the coaches use in the NFL, um, I'll refer back to the Chargers game against the Vikings where the Chargers head coach went for it on fourth down on his own 24-yard line. And he said, well, listen, if we punt the ball here, we have a 70% chance of winning. But if we get this fourth down, we have a 79% chance of winning this game. So he goes on fourth down, doesn't get it, allows the Vikings every opportunity to come back and win this game. And Kirk Cousins at that point had 350 yards and three touchdowns, no interceptions. And even during the chaos of the last couple of seconds of the game, he still managed to peg a guy in the hands and the, the, the receiver fumbled it and it wound up being picked off by the Chargers defense, luckily because he did hit that receiver in the hands. They, that should have been caught and the Chargers should have lost that game all due to a poor coaching decision that's based off analytics. And so my question to you guys is when these coaches are studying these analytics, right? Are these NFL analytics? There's no way they're team specific analytics. You don't have enough. Um, you don't have enough product there to sit there and analyze these chances based off just your team. So when you're saying, Hey, we have a 70% chance of winning this game. If we do this or an 80% chance, if we do that, is that like the whole NFL? has a chance that, you know, 70% chance and 80% chance if they do that? Or is that specifically your team? Because Kansas City might have those numbers work in their favor, but if all you've done is fail and fail and fail and fail, then you're the one that's dragging that analytic down. How many fourth downs have we gone for in Bosch? Like, it, we, we struggle to pick up third downs, and you want to talk about picking up a fourth down. Like, we, if you would take those analytics and apply them to just your team, I guarantee you you get a whole different set of numbers than you do if you analyze the whole league. They're pulling them out their ass, okay? They're doing mental gymnastics to justify their shitty decisions, okay? And, like, they're, oh, if we were to succeed at that juncture, then we would have had a 79% chance at winning. No, what's your percent chance of that play working for you, okay? Um, in Everflus's case, I understand Khalil Herbert had a hot hand, okay? That's the only positive thing you could justify and say, oh, you know, they went for it on first and one with a running back that was having a really good game. But that also means that it's pretty realistic that they handed off to Khalil Herbert in that situation. The defense can predict that, okay? All good NFL teams historically have played situational football. Analytics ignore situational football, right? So all good teams refer to, is this something that my team has been doing well? Because if you missed the first five fourth downs, but if you get the fifth fourth down in the fourth quarter with two minutes left, there's an 80% chance I'll win. But you just missed four first downs this game. Why would you think that in this situation that would work? So the problem is, is you're just ignoring situational football. And that's all really football has come down to really since, since like the Bill Belichick era, he preached situational football, won six Super Bowls doing situational football, understanding what's going on, what you can allow, what can happen, what you can't allow to happen. Prediction for Washington. What, what's your prediction? Go ahead, Richie. 23 to 7. I'm going to say 20 to 10. Washington. Okay. I got 24 10. Very good. Very, very. I, I like your guys' scores. 24 10.